Hey, and welcome back to another episode of Dunks and Donuts. I'm Jared, and with me, as always, is... Ryan! I'm Ryan. Hey, hi. How you doing? <laughs> welcome back to Dunks and Donuts, episode two. So how was, uh, how was your week? It was a very long week without any basketball. Yeah, there was no good. basketball until last evening, so it felt like it took forever. Yeah. But we came back last night, and it was by far worth the wait. Um, so Thursday night was awesome, and then the week before that was just waiting. But Love last it. night was awesome. How was your week? It was good. Um, it was kind of refreshing last night, obviously, having basketball back. But it was also refreshing without basketball for, like, a short period of time. Mm -hmm. like I didn't have to go insane every single time the Celtics played and be like overreacting and exactly. You know, but I think my favorite thing from the past week is the whole Jason Tatum MVP campaign is gaining a ton of traction. Shout out Stephen A. Smith. Um, I know, I know. I'm so, <laughs> I'm so glad it's made a little bit of a like a revival effort because he deserves it. Oh, he absolutely um, does. He absolutely yeah, he got counted out there for, I don't know, a few weeks. There were a few weeks where it was looking like nobody was going to say anything anymore. But, of course, as always, he has made his comeback. And, I mean, by comeback, I mean really just, like, doing pretty much the same thing as he was doing, just maybe with a few more points. Right. No, I agree. And, obviously, like, coming out of the All-Star break, I was like, oh, the team's going to look a little bit sloppy. I mean, a week off is rough for anybody mm -hmm. from any job, really. And uh, then they just absolutely decimated the Bulls and were like, hey, here's everything. And Derek White had 29 points or something ridiculous. And I just yes, was like... 28 points. He 28. Did so well. I'm so proud of him. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. And, like, it was good basketball, too. Like, I, there was never a point in the game where I was just like ah, uh, this doesn't look good or anything like that. It was just solid hoops the whole time. And I think yeah, for both teams as well. You no, know, it was awesome. Um, and I really like the Bulls. I don't have – I mean, I love Caruso so much. And uh, I love DeMar. So I don't ever dislike playing them because even if they do win, there are a few guys I'm still happy for and I'm happy to see them have a good game. Right. Um but we really, first quarter was nuts. It was one of those first quarters where I got just so hyped right off the bat. And we were, I don't even know, up like 15 at least. And I was pumped. Yeah. Um, and then I it started to set in where I was like, oop, then here comes the second and third quarter where it could go either way. If we lose the lead we can kind of stay stagnant or we can do what we've been doing this year right? and manage to rally in the third quarter and then pull all the way ahead again, which every time it happens, I think, oh my gosh, we're, n I, I don't think we'll ever be able to do this again. And then we do it again. And Jason was kind of sleepy in the first two, not that it mattered because everybody else was there. Right. But he woke up in the third, and we killed it. Yeah. No, I mean, we, so proud. <laughs> it, again, like I said, it was one of those games where just you expected them to come out with a little bit of rust, right? Because, I mean, mm. let's face it, we suck after two days of rest yeah. during any stretch of games. Yep. And then here we are, a week's rest off the All-Star game where everybody is just Let's face it, everybody's on vacation. They're not their head's not in the game. They're coming back. It's like you go back to work from vacation. I mean, you're miserable. You, yeah, you don't back. you're not always like right off the bat refreshed yeah. and happy to be back. You kind of need like a vacation from your vacation. Right. And uh but the Celtics, they they stayed poised, they kept with it, and like um like they talked about, but I mean Derek talked about it, Jason talked about it after the game. They were talking like down the roster. Everybody is just can they can kill you in so many different ways, and it's just such a crazy dynamic how good this team really has been. Um, 
it's awesome to watch because there are so I don't know what it was. I saw one of the muse accounts um, tweet something earlier today that was talking about how there are so many different. The, uh, there are multiple guys that can take two quarters off because then KP will show up or right. Derek will show up or Jalen will show up again. And they just have learned to cycle through and show up when one guy might be having a rough quarter Oh yeah, and pick up each other's slack. It, it's just awesome to watch. I know that we'll remember this season forever, regardless, just because some of these wins as a fan are crazy to know that that's your basketball team. And they don't play like this once every 30 games. They play like this once every five games. Right. <laughs> it's, it's insane. So yeah. Um, a really cool day back. I think that was awesome. There were 11 other games. Um, but Ours was my favorite. <laughs> oh, yeah, obviously. It has to be. Um, and I actually want to build off that really quick. So earlier you had tweeted out for people to send in questions. And uh, Pablo, his at is NukeRD5. He asked what moments convinced, uh, at least convinced us that this year's team was better than last year's team. And there's one tweet that I always have in mind whenever I think about this. It was our loss to Philadelphia, like the first couple weeks of the season, like our first loss mm -hmm. or second loss, whatever it was. And Mark D'Amico put out a tweet saying that in our two losses, they came from us playing incredibly bad, shooting incredibly poor. I think we were shooting like 33% from three or 32% from three or something like that in one of them and 28% from three in another. And then just like committing all these turnovers, like in both games, either mm -hmm. went to overtime or we lost by one shot. And like we had the final shot. And he's like, if that's where this team is at, the margin of error that they have is huge. Mm -hmm. And I always think about that tweet, like whenever we're in closed games and we pull them out, because last year, a lot of these games we lose. And we're not on pace for 64 wins. Exactly. Like so that's just something super duper crazy to me. It's exactly. just like I think about Mark D'Amico's tweet and I think about like the margin of error, like how much or how how much worse would we have had to play to just not be in the game at all? Well, and we the the games that we you could see us because I'm because <laughs> we're on the team, but um <laughs> you can see them get into their head. And you can right. watch mentally because they're all good enough to win. They just yeah, are. Right. They've proven I, that they're just good enough to win. So today's a special episode for a couple different reasons. Uh, we, we are joined by a good friend of ours. And later on, we're going to have... Uh, a recording of a, a very special guest later in this episode. But um, for now, why don't you introduce the friend we have coming? Yes. So, okay, this is very exciting. I think we mentioned this last episode. But our special guest today is Bostonian in D.C., or Meg. And she is the graphic artist who makes all of the, like, really wholesome, cute graphic design work for Celtics Twitter and our little community. And she's kind of, I think over the past few months, really blown up. I feel like every graphic I see you post gets like, I don't know, like a hundred or plus likes. Um, and it's awesome. So yeah, that's our special guest. I would like to introduce Meg. Yay, Meg. Hey, everyone. Heck yes. How are, how are you today? I am doing great. Um, we I mentioned to you both earlier that this has been a wild work week for me. So this is the best possible end to the week. And I do have Dunkin' Donuts to be on brand. Perfect. Perfect. Well, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, and obviously, it's very fitting that we wanted you to be our first guest anyway. Obviously, like Ryan said, you helped us with the logos 
purely because you're an amazing person. Um, and <clears throat> I mean, like the Twitter and headers and the YouTube banners and everything. It's just, it, it's been incredible. So sincerely. Made our lives you. so much easier, truly. Yeah. So it made easier. everything a lot easier. And I've said this before, I would not have the following that I have if it wasn't for the two of you hyping me. So I feel like that was like an act of gratitude, not a favor. So just love all around here for the Celtics community. Perfect. So t tell us a little bit about yourself. Why don't you tell the listeners um, stuff they don't know? Like, obviously, we'll we'll talk about your graphics here in a minute. But why don't you tell us a little bit about you, like what you do for work, stuff like that? Sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Meg. You know me better as Bostonian in DC on Twitter. Um, so as my handle suggests, I'm originally from Massachusetts, grew up there, um, went to public school in Massachusetts, then went to Providence College in Rhode Island for undergrad, lived in Boston for a couple years, and then moved to DC a while ago um, for grad school, stayed here because I work in education policy. So now I work at a nonprofit think tank, specifically working with education leaders at the federal, state, local level, really trying to connect them to people who are actually in schools and doing the work in communities and with students and students themselves um, with the hope of actually connect, making better strides for equity in education. So, you know, like trying to make the world a better place, both at, in my job and on Twitter. That's awesome. That's yeah. so cool. That's incredible. And I know that quite a few people that at least that I'm mutuals with, and I'm sure Ryan and you as well, I know quite a few of them work in education. So I'm sure they appreciate what you do just as much, um, if not more than the rest of us. You know? And I'll say like the teachers, the people who are doing the work in the schools are the people doing the real work. But I also love to hear from teachers. I want to hear from people on the ground. Um, so if you ever have like something you want congressional staff or state policy leaders or local leaders to hear, feel free to DM me. I would love to have education conversations with folks. You hear that, that's guys? So cool. Yep, that's if you, so cool. your teacher, anything. So um, that's awesome. But no, like that's actually super cool. Uh, growing up, <clears throat> a couple of my family members worked in education. Um, and I, I'm i also one of the people that I think teachers are severely underpaid. Oh, 100%. Um, you know, and it's just a matter of, you know, it's just like a matter of like that needs to change. Like they are shaping our future. And one thing I, I see a lot of, um, and I know this is not Celtics related, but it is you related. So this is what matters is um, a lot of people complain that just schools aren't the same anymore. And I think part of that comes from the lack of pay that the teachers get, which and in turn turns into a lack of effort, which you know, kind of ruins it for everybody, but, you know. What is your, what is your day-to-day -day schedule kind of look like doing that? Like, because it sounds like, so you're the middle person, right? Mm -hmm. Like the person that deals with the communication and that what the community would want or needs gets properly communicated to who could actually make that change, right? Yes. And so day to day is so first of all, I apologize if I get like DC jargony. I have been stuck in a think tank for the last few years, which I love my work, but like interrupt me if I say it something. It becomes that, everything, I'm yeah, sure. Like there's it's like alphabet soup down here. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of like, you know, things we get into. Um, so we do a couple different like the way we interact with folks is in a couple different ways. So we have leadership networks. So I have a congressional staff network that's specifically um, congressional staff from the education committees, bicameral, bipartisan, and they're really like graduate lecture series. So it's like, okay, what's a topic that you're interested in? What's related to federal law? And how is federal law actually impacting people on the ground? So I'm actually headed to Alabama next month in, or in April to do a site visit specifically like connecting congressional staff with folks um, on the ground. So like awesome. teachers, school visits, all of that. Um, we also do like off the record convenings. Where we're bringing people who are like, if we decide on a specific topic, I do research. We kind of interact with people. We uh, we reach out to different communities. Oftentimes we're going through like the de state par departments of education. We run mm -hmm. I my in on my team, but I don't run. There's a district superintendent network. So people who run districts offices. So 
we just have a very vast network that we can kind of plug into, try to connect with people on the ground. And then there are organizations doing incredible work to connect communities and... So I work with this incredible organization called Student Voice. It's actually student-led and student-run that wow. literally builds the capacity for students to um, actually learn the policy process as high schoolers and really understand their their how they interact um, at the state and federal level, which is incredible. So a lot of the work I do is really connecting with people who um, have access, who know the voices on the ground that need to be um, elevated and then making sure that they have the the seat at the table and also the tools that they need to feel comfortable at that table. So it's an incredible job. I, I really enjoy it. No, that sounds incredible. And um, on the flip side of that, the what's not incredible and what's not doing a great job is Ryan's internet. Um, yes. so. My internet wifey lost her Wi-Fi, y'all. Yeah, <laughs> that that was clever. That was that was clever. Good job. Good job. This is very punny, a, a punny episode. Yes. Um, you, you're going to get from me. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, you know, she she texted me and she said she's going to try to get her stuff figured out, but we can continue in the meantime. Um, so I guess we need some backstory. Like, obviously, you have this incredible job. You're in D.C. now um, and you're doing incredible things for the world or, well, the country, rather. But so... And obviously you said you're from Massachusetts. So have you just been a Celtics fan your whole life? Like, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. I literally, I think, was born to be a Celtics fan. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, it, I'm i from a huge extended family. Like my my core family is is small. I just have a, a sister who's 10 years older, but I my mom's the oldest of six. My dad was the oldest of 10. I have 40 cousins, all of whom are from like the Boston area. My dad grew up in Dorchester. My mom grew up in Somerville. I grew up a little bit outside of Boston. Um, so like all of them are rabid Boston fans. Like it just, that's what we like think about for holidays. Like it's really based around sports, but I think in particular for me, um, the reason the Celtics resonated so much is that basketball was, I swear, my first love. Uh, as I noted, my sister's 10 years older than me. She's also six feet tall and was six feet tall oh. by the time she was like 12 or 13. So you can imagine she played a lot of basketball. Yeah. So I grew up in a gym because she was in travel and AAU right. um, high school. And then she actually played um, D3 basketball and volleyball for Bowdoin, which is in Maine. So like I spent my whole life playing basketball, watching basketball, being part of it. And then I think there's part of me that like, I don't know if you can tell, from how I look, my family's pretty Irish. <laughs> and so I think the Celtics right. um, growing up in that environment is great. And for those people who follow me on Twitter, you know, my mom is also a rabid Celtics fan. So that has been part, like it's really been cool that um, my whole family are basketball fans, but it really was uh, something that connected me and my mother. Right. And uh, it's actually funny you say you grew up in, in that area. Um, so my family grew up in Medford and I was raised a lot in, in Charlestown. And then, um, like, growing up, my grandfather, he owned his own HVAC business. So we were around Somerville, Everett, like, all those areas. So I know those areas very, very well. Yeah. Um, so that's that's really funny. Um, but, no, that's actually, like, super cool um, that you, like, it's been a basketball family through and through for you. Yeah. And so what landed you in Celtics Twitter, like, did you just one day wake up and say, I wonder if there's a community of Celtics people out there? Or was it like a total accident? It was like a happy accident, weird coincidence. So okay. I, so it's, uh, I've had a personal Twitter for a long time, but because of the field that I'm in for the last, like probably five years or maybe more than that, I've had to use Twitter for my job. So I can't really be as interactive with my face and my name Twitter mm -hmm. as I am now and actually like i think people would probably be shocked to know this but like i used to check twitter like once every three weeks to like tweet something for work and <laughs> then yeah. be done right. um i think particularly like i have been again I, i'm a huge celtics fan but realizing that i could one of the things 
again, folks will know if they check my Twitter is that my mom and I text during games. Mm-hmm. So we still go on Celtics Twitter to pull information from her to text her. So like I, right. I followed some accounts on my personal Twitter, um, but really like only lightly interacted and it was more just to grab content. Right. But then, yeah, right. And so the happy accident happened. Um, I actually remember the date, <laughs> which is wild. It was March 25th of last year. The reason I know this is that I was in a wedding in Austin, Texas right. for my coworkers and my personal Twitter got hacked. Oh, wow. Okay. So I don't know why someone wanted to like hack my 200 followers <laughs> in the education <laughs> policy community. Like I'm not right. a prolific voice <laughs> on my personal Twitter. Um, but I was like with coworkers and I was like, look, because I have to use this for work, what should I do? So they yeah. said I should make a burner to follow it. And important context is that one of my coworkers is from Miami. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> well, and while she's actually not a big NBA fan, she like loves right. banter. So we have like a fun, maybe more fun for her than me back and forth between right. Heat and Celtics. So we had happened to be just talking about like the Heat versus Celtics. It was, you know, gearing up to be getting towards playoff time. So I was like, you know what? Like I need some solidarity. Um, if I'm going to make a burner account, I might as well make it for the one thing I use Twitter for, which is Celtics Twitter. Right. So I made it then. I followed a handful of accounts, but really like wasn't considering myself like a content creator or any of the things <laughs> that I am now. And I have to tell you, like this has been a wild ride because you could not tell me you know, in May of last year that, or March of last year that uh, less than a year later, I'd be on a Celtics Twitter podcast. Yeah, I. <laughs> it's funny how things work out, right? I mean, you know, I I get it. I mean, I've been there, I've done that. It, it's been similar for me, not like dealing with the hacking or anything, but if you told me a year ago, some of the opportunities I've had that I got to deal with, I just, I get it. I completely agree. And I think that's, again, I think that's awesome. I mean, it sucks that your main Twitter got hacked, but you found this basically new family within Celtics Twitter. And I don't even remember, like, I know you were talking to us earlier and you said that we were a handful of, Ryan and I were, you know, a handful of your first followers or whatever, and or the first people like you followed. And then... I've lost track of so many people. Like, it's so unfortunate because there's so many people on Twitter that I have interacted with and loved. And, you know, and I remember, like, I just remember one day, like, your name just started popping up everywhere. And I I mentioned this on the last episode uh, briefly with Ryan. I remember one of your graphics got stolen from an account. And, like, the whole, basically all of Twitter just, jumped to your aid and was like defend 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 and i thought that was super duper cool um and that's when i really noticed like your account and i was like oh like these graphics are sick and then like i started looking at them and i'm like okay this is this is awesome and uh so i think what you've done in the community is pretty great in and of itself right because like you know as much as I love Celtics Twitter and as much as we have each other's backs, right? Like the, um, the level that people went to for you over a graphic is incredible. And you don't see that a lot, which actually brings up my next question. Like what got, so like education policy, (laughs) graphic design, (laughs) like where's the, where's the crossover for that? Yeah. Um, so Again, I think people know this who follow me, but it might be shocking to some people that I have zero graphic design training. (laughs) Um, I think like the closest I can say that I've come is I had a like a little bit of Photoshop learning like data visualization for like econometrics in grad school, (laughs) not connected. Um, Though weirdly, it's so it's one of those things that again, another happy coincidence. I've had Canva and for people who aren't you know, designers of things. Canva is a pretty free, user-friendly, um, free, and there's also accounts that you can pay for, but free online tool where you can like edit, put backgrounds in, put text on different things. It's a really easy tool to use. And I first got that in grad school because I was 
um, on like the student board and I was like the social director of my grad school class. So I literally would be making like social media posts about happy hours and, um, you know, like karaoke nights for our, our like 25 people in my cohort. Yeah. And, you know, it's something I just enjoyed doing. I kind of learned different tips and tricks. And then over the years I've, you know, made t-shirts for bachelorettes or my nephew really loves things that are personalized. So I've made them like stickers and things. So it was literally just a kind of background skill that I built over time. Didn't right. really even think about how it would interact with Celtics Twitter. Again, when I joined, it was more about community building. And I do think because the first six months probably I was on Celtics Twitter were really like it was during the playoffs run in the beginning. I really just interacted with people, tried to be like positive, tried to be kind, tried to be wholesome, like all the things that I wanted to bring. So by the time I kind of clicked <laughs> that I was like, oh, I could actually make memes and graphics and gifts and all of these things. Um, I already kind of had this like pretty great following, but really uh, I think it started actually I had an idea, I think it was like October, probably actually November to do, it was when Spotify Wrapped came out. And instead yeah. of doing like your favorite artist, I did your favorite player. And of course it was Derek White. And it was like, instead of the number of hours of listen, list, like, listened, it was like, you've told the world 999 minutes, how many, how perfect he is. Right. That was the <laughs> first thing I created. It was very much a, like a silly meme, which is, you know, and very, very corny and, the best way, very on my brand. And it got a lot of interactions, but I also just enjoyed the creative outlet. I don't get that <laughs> in education yeah. policy. Um, and I think I just really was waiting for a muse and that muse turned out to be Derek White. <laughs> so it yeah, kind of started think, from there. <laughs> and I think that's awesome, right? Like, and I mean, you said it yourself, like some of these are corny. And I think my favorite one is actually about Luke Cornett, the yes. ice in his veins, <laughs> like. Can't that be corny one. without Cornette. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And like, oh my God, the game last night where he's doing the the dab, like he um, is a funny dude. Like he's really funny. And uh so I think some of these graphics are awesome. So I guess the next thing is what are your favorite graphics that you've made? Like what which ones are your favorite? Well, you already brought up, so I think it's interesting. I feel like the, my, I had a hard, I have a hard time narrowing down my favorite graphics. I think you know this because we talked about it. Um, so I, I feel like I oscillate between things that are more meme specific. Right. So things that come up during a game that I'm like, oh, that's a perfect moment. Let me make kind of something silly to interact with. And then part of it is also sometimes too, it's like I want to push myself to learn new things in terms, again, I'm not a graphic designer, so it's all of it. So half of it is me just testing out fun things that I think are cool. The other half is just being silly and corny in the community. But I will start with the Luke Cornett <laughs> ice in his veins um, meme. So I think most people know this was, I think, the first game of a back-to-back -back with the Pacers. We were in like a tighter game. Um, people are getting a little tense. He got uh foul shots <laughs> and hit them both and did like a very clumsy version of the ice in your in my vein celebration and i was like well that i absolutely need to capture yeah. <laughs> um it was cool because i got to push myself because this graphic specifically also pushed myself to do like some color like grabbing some um masking to make it a man look like an icicle <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it's ice in the veins ice in the veins <laughs> and you know adding some things but I mean, it's very fitting. Like it, it's, I think you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a special joy that I get from doing something really beautiful. That's super corny. Like it's yeah. just like the perfect mix no, of things. Right. So I, it was a great mix of uh, something that was like silly, but I hopefully well executed. And I think the other thing too, for anyone who's like an aspiring memer graphic person on Twitter, being able, I've learned how to do things pretty quickly. So I think I was able to turn this around like maybe within 20 minutes of it happening. And it really, it took off. And I've used this a few other times. Basically anytime Luke does anything, <laughs> I retweet the ice in his veins because I think yeah. it's hilarious. No, I think it's, I think it's great. And like, obviously I know there's a million other graphics you've made and I'm sure you have other favorites, which we'll get to in a second. But 
I need to say, like, some of the gifts you've made are by far some of my favorite things in the world. And I will fight anybody. It is GIF, not JIF. Oh, agreed. Full GIF. Um, yes. But I think my favorite, and it was one of the very, I don't know if it's one of the first ones you made, but I know it's one of the very first ones I saw of, like, what you are capable of. Uh, I forget what game it was, but Jason Tatum hit a monster three, and he had that like insane mean mug walking down the court that he blows the kiss of death, and you like you captured the gif perfect, and I was like, th- like this is it, like this is what I've been looking for since last year, <laughs> like, and so I just you are I got to admit you are quite talented when it comes to this stuff whether you you know you said you don't have much experience with it but like you've done a great job and like like ryan said earlier um unfortunately before her camera (laughs) passed away um (laughs) you like your stuff gets a lot of recognition like you said o'shea Brissett has shared your stuff and o'shea if you're listening man i would love to have you on the show Um, he's such a vibe yeah, like, and, you know, he's, I think he's honestly one of my favorite players on this team. Oh, yeah. Um, just for his personality and, like, what he does off the court. Like, I enjoy the whole photography thing. So, O'Shea, again, if you're listening, I'd love to have you on, talk about your photography, your filmography, whatever. I'll plug that later. Um, anyway, so, Meg, like, obviously we talked about Luke Cornett. What's your other favorite uh, graphic that you've made? Sure. I do want to do a quick pitch for the gifts quickly. So that is literally, so for anyone who's interested, again, I, it's so interesting that some, a lot of things that can get you like this kind of buzz on Twitter are just like Googling, how do I do this? Yeah. (laughs) And so the first gift that I actually made was um, I wanted to, someone was saying like mean things about Jalen Brown that he didn't deserve. And I wanted to do the like, stay on that side gif it didn't exist. And I was like, well, that can't be okay (laughs) in this community. So I literally was like, Googled, I'm like, okay, how do you make a GIF and how do you put it on Twitter? There was some like guessing and testing, but it's actually a pretty simple process, but I love making the GIFs for the community because I feel like I can get a little bit uh, like protective of the graphics that I make and the meme, like memes, I know that they can get a life of their own, particularly if it's a format, Uh, but I do get a little sad when people like take it (laughs) and share it. But gifts are meant to be like I'm a millennial, so like a reaction gif is how I prefer to like interact with the world. <laughs> and um, I think I love the idea that like someone who never heard of me might not even be on Twitter can search, you know, Jason Tatum stank face, and that comes up. Yeah, no, I think that's great. Um, but to go back to the question of favorite graphics, I think another one of my memeable ones. I have to talk about my favorite player and my favorite person to to hype up, which is Derek White. Um, so I started to do, when he, one of the things that I started to do when I realized I liked doing this graphic work is I decided to almost daily make a Derek White um, GIF, or no, Derek White graphic that would hype his all-star campaign. Great. Didn't have the following to make that happen, maybe next year, <laughs> um, but, I created a hot hand, like a Derek White hot hands gif where he is, or sorry, I keep on saying gif now. Derek White hot hands graphic. Yes. Where his hands look like this on fire. Yeah, so double. I got him. So it's like this one I was I was proud of just because it, there was a level of like I wanted to get the right emotion. It's him actually jumping next to Drew Holiday. Yeah. That I pulled from, but it looks like he's screaming. <laughs> How do you hot hands? Yeah, like I, I impressed myself on this one. I was oh, like, wow, this is, maybe I'm not, you know, maybe it's something I can do. So that one I really love. And I also just love any time I get to um, hype up Derek White because he's right. my favorite player. Yeah, but I, I've just had a lot of fun creating them. I really love the best ones are the ones where like there's inspiration during the game. Right. I can kind of turn it around and really be able, again, the reason I do this isn't clout, right? Like, it is wonderful if there are a lot of likes. It's not like I don't care about the shares and the likes, but I really like that it's drawn people into a community with us. I think you, me, Ryan are all here because we love the community aspect. 
And I have to say too, like one of the things that I've really enjoyed and has been surprising about Celtics Twitter is that from my like ignorant, barely ever used Twitter perspective before, the things that I saw originally from a lot of like bigger Twitter Twitter accounts were clout chasing, were like kind of saying egregious things just to get engagements. And it's it's nice that I've been able to grow. I think I'm close to 1,300 followers in less than a year um, with wholesome community based like silly, yeah, punny that. content. What you just said about your main account, right? Some of the larger accounts you follow being agreed like egregiously tweeting out for engagement and for um, just clout chasing, right? Is it brings just a lot of toxicity and negativity to Twitter and obviously even as great as the Celtics community is, and I'm sure other fan bases experience it, there's a good amount of negativity within those spaces. And I guess for you, you know, we've, we've been talking about all these great interactions you've had, um, especially with your graphics and whatnot. Um, and, and you're more than welcome to share if you'd like, what, have you had like any super negative interactions um, that's a great question. So I think there's a couple things, right? Like I am a more positive account. I'm not telling people how they have to act right. on Twitter. And I know that there are some people in the fan base who like to be like more reactive or like hold our team. To I think there's a difference between like clout chasing negative accounts and people who are holding our team accountable in the way they think it is, right? Like right. we spend time, all of us who are part of Celtics Twitter, time, energy, money on this team. So I get that some people are like going to be more hypercritical or pulling out stat lines. That's one thing I do think. And I also think that I've been lucky in that I've tried to purposely craft people or like craft a following that's more positive. The few negatives I've had, like there's always those couple of like, actually not usually Celtics Twitter, but like Heat or other accounts that will, you know, if I put something silly, they'll say something negative. I'm actually pretty okay with blocking people yeah. because I don't need, you don't, I can have my boundaries. You don't, you don't deserve my engagement. Um, there's been a couple of interesting ones. The ones that have been, that I've kind of gone to bat for, usually I kind of ignore negative comments are when I shared the raise the age bill that Jalen Brown was working on. Yeah, um, yeah. That's something that my sister is deep, like she's a head attorney for juvenile justice, public defenders right. in a Springsteen, Massachusetts. She's been working on this for year, years. And again, like I work in education policy. This is something I know about. There are people who just like, you can share something with a link and they're going to be like, this is dumb and don't. So there is right. some education that's happened. I think the other thing that's been interesting to witness as someone who is like, like definitely hopeful, positive, kind, like wants to be wholesome. I get that's not for everyone, but some people have come for me for the positivity and assume that kindness and um, hope is from a place of like being naive or not in touch yeah. with reality. And for me, that's not the truth. Again, like my job is pr pretty brutal when it comes to the reality of the world. I, my life hasn't been sunshine and rainbows. And so I choose to like be resilient through mm. kindness and so just like you don't always have to if you see someone who's having being silly and funny on twitter and it's not your vibe you don't have to interact it's so interesting the people who are just like this is dumb <laughs> Post that's, i'm like yeah of course it's dumb it's blue cornet as an icicle like what did you right <laughs> um and that and that's actually incredibly valid and that that act that also helps go into probably the biggest surprise of Dunks and Donuts so far outside of it just like happening. Cause I mean, <clears throat> Ryan and I joke about it, but like this wouldn't have happened without you. So like the fact that it happened is a surprise in and of itself. Like we, we've been talking about starting a podcast together for almost two years now and or at least over a year at the very, at the very least. And, it just it never happened. Um, so like I said, just being here, doing the thing and having guests is, is a surprise in and of itself. But the biggest surprise so far 
is Ryan and I had the privilege to interview Richard White. And obviously, by your reaction, everybody knows you're a huge Derek White fan. Yes. Um, so, ironically, the interview that we did with Richard White is about combating negativity on Twitter and in social media. Because he is one of those people that is constantly... Like, he doesn't go back and forth with anybody. He's not ever, oh, you suck, or no, this player sucks. Like, nothing like that. He goes, oh, you think this person sucks? Okay, well, here's stats and here's facts to counter your false narrative. So believe what you want, but but this is what it is. And he just, like, mic drops every single time. Every time. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, um, he's my favorite mutual. No offense to you and Ryan, you're up there in my top no, ten. I mean, I don't, he I don't blame you. like the the day my favorite player's dad followed me on Twitter. Like, I think I might get that tattooed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it, he's an incredible mutually. I mean, he is a lovely, lovely guy, um, very intelligent, and it's just incredible like some of the stuff he does and you see like i think the one of the best things about well a one of the coolest things about celtic twitter is just how interact it's a new way to interact with players the media but then in particular like parents or family members of twitter but i think the thing that i've loved about following him is that i get that we'll never we don't know the players right. Re really right like all of this is parasocial in a way you know in, in different aspects but he, Derek White, one of the reasons he's one of my favorites, beyond being like an unsung, unsung hero, a winning player, someone who you want on your team, is that he seems like such a humble, deeply right. kind individual. So seeing that his dad is someone who is like really kind, really like a great, in, really interactive. And I think the other thing that's really amazing about Richard White is that he is very fact-based, right? He's like, let's right. get out of the narratives that the media are saying. Like, let me bring up like, let me tell you how Derek did on defense last night. Yeah. Let's like he always reshares things that are really elevating the team, and I think really sees the long game. Right? It's easy to be reactive. I tend to be lucky because I've been trained in my job to not be reactive. Policy is a long game. Richard White plays a long game when it comes to a championship team. Right. All righty. So, Mr. White, I uh, I do want to thank you for for giving me the opportunity to pick your brain about kind of the co negative connotations around social media and how they sort of define um, narratives around certain players and teams and stuff like that. Um, so thank you for, thank you for joining. Oh, no problem. All right. So my first, um, my first question for you is what, I guess, when you get onto social media, right, and you get involved with, you know, fans who can be a little bit toxic and be a little bit negative, what goes through your mind when you're thinking, like, when you see this stuff and it makes you want to just respond in the way you do? Because you're always posting facts, you're always posting sort of, you know, what, one tweet that comes to mind of yours is that. Um, somebody had put out a thread about Jason Tatum and how he wasn't always drafted to a super team. And you you retweeted it and said, it's not that there's a reading issue with NBA Twitter. It's that he's not their guy on their team. So where does that kind of mentality come from? Uh, just just watching it, watching it evolve. So that, that's kind of why, why I, I put numbers and data points out there because uh, you're basically never going to change anybody's mind. If somebody likes steak, then no matter what you tell them, never going to go away from having that steak. It, it, it just, it, it, it's a no-win situation. They, they love who they love. And if your person or, or somebody, uh, anybody other than their person is against their person, then they just defend everything upon, you know, all else. So, um, you know, the the main thing it just kind of got me was it's like we're talking NBA players. There's like 450 with guaranteed contracts. And, you know, if you take 
the top 20%, we're talking like 90 players or whatever, um, they're, they're all very good. So, I mean, whether you like someone or you don't like someone, I, I can't get into, I, you can like someone without discounting what other people do. And, that, and, that, and that's what the, the app, app is turned into. It's, oh, Trey Young does this, Derek does this. Oh, well, I'm a Trey Young fan, so no matter what Derek's done, you know, he, he's he's not better than Trey, blah, 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 blah. But then you're just ignoring ignoring what accomplishments Derek has and vice versa. People who say, right. oh, Derek have it over over Trey. I mean, Trey's putting up, p- putting up numbers. And to some people, that's all that matters. I mean, you can, you basically can see through, through their, their tweets, the filter of, who scores the most, who has the most assists, who has the most whatever, and that's the best person at that. So, but, you know, in the the course and the, the scheme of things, you know, there's a lot of people who are the best of the best, but at the end, they don't win. I mean, you, you know, I mean, LeBron James is considered, you know, this, this generation's goat. He's won one title in the last what 10 something years you know and people want to poo poo it and say it was in the bubble they still won but being the best player doesn't guarantee that his team is always in the finals i mean he did have that run when he was in the east but lately the best players in the nba don't all don't all, don't all actually you know get to the finals I mean, right we got to the finals 2 years ago Miami got to the finals last year. In the grand scheme of how NBA people look, neither one of those teams are considered great teams. I mean, if you know personally, you know, I, I like the Celtics, but you know, going against Golden State, Golden State had won the championship. They still had their their core, you know, championship core. You know, people look at you know you know you you look at that. Last year, Denver broke through against Miami, so you had basically two unproven teams so somebody had to win right and, and denver was definitely by far better than better than miami no that's for sure and and i i completely agree with you like i think you know people like you said they kind of ignore everything around it outside of certain numbers to to kind of prop up their people but now on the flip side of that right you have guys who will criticize their own team. Like, I'm not going to mention any names, but I have a tweet in front of me talking about uh, back <clears throat> about a week before Christmas, Jalen Brown was averaging, it was, I think, 7.2 potential assists per game. And he was finishing games with about five assists per game. And that was the best on the team at like for that stretch of games. Mm-hmm. And there's people retweeting it, criticizing Jalen Brown, saying that that's not good. It's underwhelming and calling it bad basketball. And so I guess my next question for you is, when, how do you combat that, right? Like, what kind of narratives or what kind of facts do you have to present to turn it so that people aren't criticizing their own players for playing well or – I mean, I guess that's a relative term, right? Because what I think might be good versus what you mm-hmm. might think is be, or what you might consider good might be different. But, you know, it's just you see it a lot. Or even another one, someone's talking about how they were bothered that Jason and Jalen didn't post a photo together during the All Star break on their individual social medias. Mm-hmm. So, and I've seen you, you know, kind of clap back at people who tweet that kind of stuff as well the the more negative side compared to the comparisons so what how um how is that something that we can kind of is a community combat it like that type of negativity i don't well i don't think you can ever really combat it because people are going to do things you know uh, like the old dr phil thing you know people do do things because they get something out of it. And if being negative and being miserable, they get something out of it because if they didn't, they wouldn't keep, they wouldn't keep doing it. And 
the problem is when they do it, it's, you know, there's multiple reasons, you know, now, now X, you get, you know, if you get a certain number of engagements, you can make some money if you sign up or whatever. So, so there's money involved. Whenever money involved, then it shakes over the whole thing. Cause what I say may not be right, but it's making me money. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing it. Um, the other one is there's several people. Probably within the cell day one on one, it's like a, it's like a teeter totter. If you praise one, then the, you have to go down. The other, the other one goes down, and, and vice versa. Right. So, I mean, the, the the main thing to you know you know to it is just to to bring information because then that's for my sanity. I mean, I can't really go off on on different things. I mean, there's probably some other things I could probably say that I, I don't because of who I am and who I'm related to. And, and you know, it's, it's a pub, public, public image. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes that stuff, especially, you know, personally, it would, you know, and when people, you know, take shots at Derek or whatever, for whatever reason, it, you know, it, 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 it kind of stings and you, you, I have to like count to 10 and not, not, not lash back. Right. So, um, I mean, you can always, block so i mean i i blocked like tons of people before because like for the last year and a half the hair thing if i saw that boom you're gone i right. <laughs> don't care <laughs> whatever it is because and then and then i i kind of softened and i just muted them because i i came to the realization that the better he played the more comments on his appearance and his hair came out so, so they, they couldn't say anything about his game. So they wanted right. to go to something that they could attack. And and other people would go, hey, yeah, that, yeah that, that's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a lot of cow, cow followers out there who find the joke, you know, Jalen can't dribble with his left hand. Uh, you know, uh, you know, back when we had Marcus Smart, he was taking, you know, crazy shots or or, you know, whatever, you know, oh, Joe Missoula doesn't do actually anything. I, I mean, I don't know anybody can, that is having a successful season not do anything. I mean, <laughs> yes, exactly. Saying, I wish I could be as bad as Joe Missoula in my life. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, <laughs> I was going to say, I wish I had that negative of an impact. <laughs> and do you guys have it? That's some of what Richard White like brings to the table with, again, he do, he's not using that toxic positivity, right? Cause there's always that flip side of being overly positive, but he's just using facts in common sense when it comes to, um, when it comes to these false narratives. And I think, I think he's a special, special person to follow. I mean, again, he's a great guy. Derek's obviously a fan favorite and, universally loved it seems i don't think i've never met anybody who dislikes Derek white except maybe some miami fans for that buzzer beater but <laughs> i just think you know overall richard white definitely has a lot of wonderful insight and again very intelligent and i know i've been overreactive at points and he's been very um he's been very good at the whole like helping at least me like he's replied to me specifically and told me like, Hey, control what you can control. And, you know, he's been a, just a great leader and, um, you know, he's kind of donned the mantle of being the voice of reason on Celtics Twitter. So it's yeah. been incredible. He's definitely the moral compass. And I also love that he, there's this like kind of culture of dunking on people. And I don't feel like that's where it comes from. Like he's genuinely like, let's talk about this. <laughs> like yeah. this is, these are the facts. I think that's just really pure. Um, oh, yeah. And you just, you can tell he loves basketball and Derek yeah, so much. All right. So Meg, um, we've talked about Derek White. We've talked about your graphics. We've talked about, we've learned a lot about you. And I think our listeners have definitely learned a lot about you. And it's been incredible having you on Dunks and Donuts. I mean, you are, in a sense, part of the crew, right? Like you are a big reason the show exists. So um, before we end it, is there anything else you want to say to the listeners? Um, just first of all, 
thanks to you and to Ryan, wherever she is in the, you know, etherverse, internetverse, um, for having me on. This has been so much fun. Again, thanks to both of you for being incredibly um, great mutuals and really helping get me to this point. Um, and then to just Celtics Twitter, again, if you are interested in being uh, mutuals with someone who loves kind and kind and corny content, feel free to follow me. And as always, um, Derek White is uh, should have been an all-star. Perfect. And I mean, again, I completely agree. Derek White should have been an all-star, but here we are. Mm -hmm.